Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming to the Oakland Metro Opera House. Thank, Thank you. you, Tom and Mia, so much for letting us use this amazing space. It is a cultural anchor in Jack London since 2001, 15 years. That's incredible. Um, thank you for letting us use this space to convene this important conversation. And I'm sorry I'm standing in front of our panelists, uh, but I want to make sure everybody can uh, hear and see. Um, so tonight, we are talking about homelessness right here, right in our very own uh, backyard. Uh, our own neighbors are experiencing homelessness, and this is an important issue that um, is, is, there are so many, so many uh, sectors and uh, areas of momentum that are coming together and demanding that this conversation happen, and we're so pleased to facilitate this. Um, and we are looking for a compassionate solution. We are all here tonight to find, to talk about solutions and to perhaps debate solutions. And we have some uh, very experienced folks on our panel to uh, hear from and learn from. And I'll introduce them. Um, Elaine de Caligny, who is the director of Everyone Home, will be joining us very shortly. Uh, we'll have her introduce herself when she uh, arrives. She, uh, Everyone Home is Alameda County's roadmap for ending homelessness. Uh, we have Peter Radu, who is the co-author of a Place to Be, which is uh, a report that was undertaken by the Goldman School of Public Policy, uh, initiated by the city of Oakland, I believe. And uh, it is uh, titled, the byline is Report on Alternatives to Unsanctioned Encampments. We also have um, Bridget Cook, who is representing Lynette McElhaney, uh, our council pre president's office. and. Uh, Thank you, for, thank you for stepping in at the very last moment. She didn't know she was going to be up here. Um, and we have Andy Stamfield, who is a resident of a local encampment. Thank you all for being here. And we'll hear from each of you just for a few minutes on your perspectives on local homelessness and what you're doing. Um, and when Elaine comes, she'll talk about... Uh, Elaine's here. Oh, hi, Elaine. Welcome. Oh, perfect timing. Come on. Yeah. And this is Elaine. <laughs> Uh, this is Elaine of Everyone Home. So, thank you all so much. <laughs> we'll get her set up in a civilized way. <laughs> we'll get we'll get a professional to help with the mics. Um, I've been told that the ambient uh, noise level is really bad in here. So, if people have trouble hearing, let us know so we can correct the situation. Thank you for being here and. Um, after we hear from each of them, we will open this up for questions or points of discussion that you want to hear more about, ideas, uh, and I also have question cards if you don't want to t speak into a microphone or we can pass the microphone if you, if you do. Um, could I just recognize any uh, elected officials in the room or anyone representing elected officials? I don't mean to embarrass our council, council member, Noel Gallo. Um, I'll, also, uh, someone uh, RSVP'd to me from Barbara Lee's office, so I think we may be joined by a representative of uh, Barbara Lee also. So, thank you all. Enjoy. <laughs> so, maybe everyone can, uh, maybe let's start with Peter, because he's been here the longest. <laughs> sure. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Peter Radu. I'm a policy analyst in the Department of Homelessness and Supportive Housing in the city and county of San Francisco. Um, and as Sablon mentioned, I was a co-author on uh, A Place to Be, which is a report that was looking at the status quo of unsanctioned homeless encampments in Oakland and um, taking a first stab at providing some, uh, some thoughts about what we could do differently um, and very much looking forward to the conversation uh, uh, this, this evening. What I'm working on in San Francisco, just very briefly, is... Uh, the Department of Homelessness and Supportive Housing is brand new. Uh, we've been operational since July 1st. Uh, so in addition to uh, figuring out how to make sure that everyone gets paid and that the lights stay on, uh, we're also trying to figure out how to coordinate uh, what is a really massive uh, service portfolio in San Francisco. The city spends $241 million annually on homeless services, which is a truly staggering amount, uh, and yet we lack some basic capacity to, for example, 
uh, use data effectively to track service provision and, and to target needs, to, uh, services to needs rather. Um, we lack inventory in our portfolio in terms of being able to provide housing exits for folks that need them. There is no very limited supply of housing in San Francisco. So thinking strategically uh, about how we uh, as a city can approach that and specifically approach the unsheltered population, uh, which has grown in recent years, um, is, is what I uh, have been working on and what I look forward to, uh, to discussing a little bit. Um, so. Um, I'm very much pleased to be part of this conversation. I, I work in San Francisco, but uh, live in Berkeley, so um, uh, San Francisco is a great place to work, but, but the East Bay is definitely home, and so I'm, I'm uh, glad to be a part of this discussion. Good evening, Bridget Cook, uh, Council Member Lynette McElhaney. I'm her senior community liaison. Um, Council Member McElhaney, has been working on a project with the county uh, of Alameda for about two months now. Um, as you may be well aware, the number of homeless, or I'm sorry, unhoused residents has risen dramatically uh, in the last year plus. And so uh, with 60% of our unhoused residents residing in District 3, it became very critical um, for her to take a leadership role in trying to find a solution with the city. Uh, unlike San Francisco, which is a city and a county combined, the city by itself does not have enough resources to fully address the issues. So um, she worked with uh, Supervisor Keith Carson to develop a, a working table, which includes staff from both sides to uh, try to work out an, a solution um, while we have this emergency, the state of emergency for housing at this time. Um, she was able to bring forth a resolution to the city council to try to at least put some money on the table. The request was 400,000. She was able to receive 190,000. And so the committee is currently working on a plan looking at two different models, uh, one sanctioned, one unsanctioned, um, to be able to provide support services and to really have a long-term strategy to move our unhoused residents from not being housed into housing while providing them with some critical supports um, as they are residing on the streets. So that's what we're working on and, and we can talk a little bit more in details later. Uh, my name is Andy Stanfield. I live in um, a local houseless encampment. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I won't spend a whole lot of time with introductions and, and history for myself. Um, this is the second time I've been homeless. Um, currently, since May, uh, my current camp is one that's uh, very publicly visible, and I think that that's one reason Jaylid reached out to us. Um, I'm just really excited to be here. I've been overwhelmed by how much positive support both uh, uh, the council and the business district itself, the, the business people of the district have uh, been willing to listen, asking the right questions and, and wanting to help. So when Savlon asked me to be here, I, I was pretty stoked about it. I'm pretty nervous right now, so I'm gonna pass it over there. <laughs> well, <clears throat> You're nervous and I'm embarrassed. So I um, am being asked to send profuse apologies from my executive assistant who put six o'clock in my calendar. And I was driving up the freeway thinking, oh, I'm on time and I left out of the office in plenty of time and she called me and said, where are you? It started at 5.30. So um, she and I are both very sorry, but really glad to, to be here. So I'm Elaine DeColony. I'm the director of Everyone Home, which is the backbone organization leading Alameda County's effort to end homelessness by the year 2020. And we work with city governments, county departments, local nonprofits, and affordable housing developers to have a coordinated approach to what is a solvable problem. But what I will say is that, that Lack, being homeless, experiencing homelessness is fundamentally a housing issue. And we've spent a lot of time and money 
trying to end homelessness without building housing. And it, it's, it's kind of crazy when you think about it, but we've spent millions and millions over decades doing lots of things besides making sure there's enough housing in San Francisco or the East Bay. And so, um, I, I, you know, the conversation I am interested in having is juggling the short-term needs and the long-term solution to the issue of homelessness and wanting to make sure the short-term responses don't undercut the long-term strategy, which is to make sure there's enough housing for people to actually move into. And if we spend a lot of money creating infrastructure uh, for uh, encampments and resources, do we start to reinforce the case that it's okay to be without a home in America? And I think it's not. I think shelter is as fundamental as food and health care and education and things we have committed to as a society are essential to life. And there's hardly anything more essential than a place to live. And uh, so we have really got to change the conversation in America and in the Bay Area. And I think we're beginning to change it by putting the housing bond on the ballot um, to build affordable housing. And the city of Oakland has put, put an infrastructure bond on its ballot that includes some commitments to housing. And we're working on laws, uh, protections, for tenants and we're improving our strategies for people who are currently without a permanent place to live. But that is, we, we've just got to be louder and stronger that housing is a fundamental human need and a human right. And that housing needs to be permanent, not temporary, not subject to the elements, but permanent, safe, and affordable. So um, uh, when the recession hit in 2009, we adopted a new strategy called uh, rapid rehousing it and included uh, the, some money for preventing people from losing their housing, but trying to rapidly move them back into housing. So rather than going through long-term programming and um, a lot of clinical services which people may need and want, but they will do a better job with those services if they have a stable roof over their head. That was the premise. And that in fact proved to be true. Most of the people that were housed using that program did not return to, uh, did not lose their housing again. That strategy worked great in a recession because landlords were very excited to see rent subsidies and back rents being paid. Not such a good tool. It's, a, it's, it's not the sharpest tool we've got in this overheated market. And so, not to pick on San Francisco, but it has a higher fair market rent. So when it will pay a subsidy, Landlords in the East Bay are like, yeah, thanks, we'll take that subsidy because you can't get people housed in San Francisco with the fair market rent. We can't use fair market rents here to house people in this county. So even when we've got this tool, we're still pushing poor people further out of the city and of the communities they think of as their home. And building affordable housing is also important, but it's slow. It takes years and sometimes as long as a decade to site and fund and build and move people into affordable housing. So I'm, I'm struggling with that question because I don't feel like in this market we can use public dollars to purchase our way out of homelessness. And I don't think we can build our, I mean, eventually that is the solution to build our way out of, house, out of the housing crisis because we don't have enough units uh, for multiple income levels in uh, the Bay Area right now. 
but I am really interested in reflecting on what kinds of uh, um, policies we can have to protect renters in their own home and protect units from having the rents get jacked up when they turn over so that people can actually afford to be in them or more leniency around how much income over your rent you need to have or more leniency around eviction histories or criminal backgrounds and sometimes our affordable housing developers are the strictest on those things and they have public money but they have to convince their city councils that only the angel Gabriel and the 12 disciples will move into their units if they cite it in their neighborhood. And so their tenant restrictions are so ridiculous, no homeless people can ever get in those units. So I think we've got to look at policies uh, around renting and, uh, and sort of mitigating the market, because on its own, the market is just going to push poor people out of their urban core. And it won't rehouse people who don't have homes now. Uh, can I field that? Um, so I, I, you bring up some very good points, but I, I, I think that one thing that is really missing, before I get further into this, I want to say I don't represent the homeless community. There's no such thing as the homeless community. In my camp alone, the ethnic diversity, the age diversity, political diversity, everything, it's kind of a microcosm of the U.S. itself. Um, and we come from a lot of places. And to, to be quite honest, out of all of the homeless people I know, not just in my camp, because I do get around, <laughs> um, and you talk to other street people, um, I only know three people who were actually forced out of their place because of, of rising uh, rents currently. Mm -hmm. And I don't know everybody, but it's a, it, it's a growing problem. I, I, I think it's happening more. Um, there needs to be an understanding of what life on the streets is like. Um, a complaint I often hear about is, well, people just aren't going for the services that are already offered. And it's simply not true. Um, there are times when the service offered is a piece of paper with phone numbers on it. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard enough to keep a charge on my phone, let alone call these 50 numbers, find out that 25 of them are out of service, another 10 are not what they say they are, um, and that kind of thing. In my experience, I, lim I limited totally in, in my true. limited experience, uh, the number one reason for homelessness is uh, uh, mental health issues. I know that that's why I'm on the streets. Um, <clears throat> I just present well. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's uh, uh, it's very very difficult. It's easier to become homeless than it is to get out of it. And believe me when I tell you, it is very easy. Because I had a job making six figures a year uh, when I became homeless um, for the first time. Once you're there, your lifestyle completely changes. First off, you are completely concentrated on Maslow's hierarchy. Everything is survival. And that's from the moment you wake up. How do I procure food? How do I procure sanitation? Oh my god, I have to poop. It's a simple thing. You cannot just go to your bathroom, you know? Um, and so whatever long-term solutions we're looking at, there has to be something in the interim yeah. where we do feel safe, uh, where we can get clean, where we can answer some uh, public health issues. Uh, a friend of mine right now who wanted to be here is, is ill. Um, for, for two days he's been ill. And that's 100% because, you know, sometimes... We can't wash our hands before we eat a sandwich. Um, it's really difficult to deal with all of that stuff and then having to run around to five, ten different places just trying to put your name on a list uh, and then waiting for what happens and being available when the call comes. That's just what I, I wanted to put out there. I think the, the biggest thing we're missing from our toolkit is a, is a fundamental understanding of, of life on the streets. I think that Elaine said it really um, best in terms of the lack of housing, uh, but to bring it to the city, uh, the city has a, a site that's called, we call it the Henry, which is um, transitional housing. It is the only 
um, full service one I believe that we have. And the success rate at the Henry um, has been really good in terms of being able to move folks from being unhoused, transitioning them into permanent housing. Um, the problem goes back to we only have that one. And so again, having more housing, having more of those locations, when people talk about the Navigation Center, if you talk to our housing staff and they're like, well, we've been doing that for years, we just didn't get any press about it. Um, and so that's what the Henry has been doing for, for a number of years now. So we need to have more of that in our toolkit. So we have a place to get people stabilized and get them prepared and ready. And then I think the next part is you can't just put someone in the housing. Um, for those of you who may have seen Dogtown Redemption or any of those type of films, to notice that if a person has some other underlying issue, they're gonna need continuous support. You start with giving them shelter, but you continue with giving them the, sh the other types of support they need until such time that they're ready to be weaned off of that and they can go on and be on their own. So I think those are the two other tools um, that we, we need for the city of Oakland. I would echo everything that my fellow panelists have said. Um, I think there's two things that I think about coming from the perspective of San Francisco, I can cite some numbers there to give you a sense of just how acute the need is, and I know that the situation is very similar for Oakland. What we lack uh, in, in every city and county in the Bay Area is, uh, is housing inventory and uh, interim solutions uh, while we work towards building more housing and finding more, finding more housing exits. Um, in terms of housing inventory, the most recent homeless count in San Francisco indicated that there were 6,686 people uh, who were unhoused, 3,500 of whom were unsheltered. Uh, most people believe that to be a pretty drastic undercount, um, so it's likely greater than that. Uh, we have 6,300 uh, units of permanent housing that the city itself funds and controls within its portfolio, but most of those are already occupied. And in fact, there's a year-over-year year retention rate of 96%, which means that on a monthly basis, we get about 18 to 20 vacancies in our portfolio. And for 3,500 people on the street, you do the math, right? There's, there's literally no housing exits. The other solution, though, is that Ideally, we can find an exit for people that are in our portfolio that maybe have been there for a while, have found some stability, uh, and uh, are able to move on to, to a greater amount of self-sufficiency, right? To, to find something maybe in, in, the, uh, uh, in, in the housing market. The problem, as Elaine mentioned, is that there's no housing exits because there is no affordable housing market. Uh, and so consequently, San Francisco has been using rapid rehousing dollars to house people as far away as Stockton, which is a extremely ethically fraught policy issue. First of all, upro uprooting people from their communities. Uh, then there's also the inter-county problem of service provision to make sure that they are stabilized and connected to the resources that they need to find a new community and find a new life wherever they're winding up, uh, which speaks to what I think is something that I haven't heard yet, which is a regional approach to, to dealing with this issue. Uh, every time each individual city, uh, I can speak for example for my home city of Berkeley, which is notorious for killing any proposal to, de to develop new housing. Every time that happens, we are, we are sealing our fate to making sure that housing is unavailable and unaffordable. Uh, and so, I think we need to start moving beyond the approach of each city being able to control its jurisdiction and, and, and not recognizing the consequences that it has for the entire region. Uh, and so if we can find a way to, to, to coordinate our efforts, to build more housing, to find more solutions, uh, I think that's important. And in the meantime, I just want to be very brief about this. The Navigation Center, which Bridget mentioned, uh, is a great example, I think, of one of those interim solutions. It's a very low barrier shelter at 16th and Mission Street in San Francisco. Uh, I've been working uh, with that program for about a year now, and I do weekly data reports on it. Um, the idea there is that whatever your barrier is to using traditional shelter, 
Maybe you have a pet, maybe you have a romantic partner and traditional shelters won't accommodate you as a couple. Maybe you have an active substance abuse problem uh, and aren't ready to engage with some of the rules about being clean and sober. Whatever it is, the Navigation Center was designed to remove those barriers. And more importantly, we had a direct pipeline to the city's housing portfolio. So we prioritized every vacancy in our master lease portfolio in San Francisco to Navigation Center clients. So we had an interim solution where whatever your barriers were, we would deal with them or we would welcome them and we had a pipeline to housing. And we were still finding that it was taking 94 days on average to house people because they were coming in without photo IDs, without incomes, some of these basic things that when we say housing first, it doesn't always translate into rapid housing. And so I think that why we need to redouble, redouble our efforts towards housing first and towards committing to housing as the ultimate long-term and the only long-term solution to homelessness. In the meantime, I'm done with kidding myself that we can do this right away. There's a tonight problem for so many uh, folks and I think how do we address that? Do we, do we increase shelter bed capacity? Do we add more navigation center or navigation center-like programs? Or do we think about sanctioning encampments or tiny houses as many communities are beginning to explore with? I think any and all of these would meet the spirit of finding an interim solution that is imperfect and, and, and should be time limited as we work towards the larger goal of building more housing and bringing more units online. And there's another tool that I want to comment about, which is called coordinated entry. So your absolutely, your narrative of calling 10 places that aren't open or you've got to come back the first Thursday at 2 p.m. and, uh, you know, bring all your documents that got rained out the week before and so never mind. And uh, this is really such a true story I've heard many times across this whole county and certainly in Oakland. So. Um, we have about 1,800 permanent supportive housing units in Alameda County. Those are units where the rent is deeply subsidized, so someone pays only 30% of whatever their income is, and if their income is zero, they pay zero. And it comes with wraparound services. But those 1,800 units are in 29 different projects. Mm -hmm with all, each have their own wait list. And, and so you're talking about people struggling with disabilities from mobility issues to cognitive impairments to substance abuse and other mental health have to navigate getting their names on and keeping their data updated on 29 different lists. So what that means is they don't make it through the, the, the process. So what coordinated entry is going to do in Alameda County is create a registry for all people experiencing homelessness who have persistent disability, whatever that disability is. And, and we're trying to get all 1,800 of those units to pull from that single list and we will support the, the folks with the longest histories of being without a home and the highest need and disability to navigate the application process, help them get their documents ready so the second an opening comes up, if, if they're at the top of the list, they will go straight into that unit. We think it'll make it faster for landlords to fill units and more uh, supported and seamless for disabled people to get housed. And they won't even have to come indoors. They can get housed straight from the streets. San Francisco has a great track record of that, but we do too in Alameda County of housing folks directly off the street. So we are putting in place coordinated entry. Uh, Oakland has what it calls a family front door and is doing this for families. It would also be you go one place you get screened and matched to the resources you need rather than a sheet of paper where you're responsible for making all the calls, for pitching yourself, for answering the questions right, et cetera. You'll get support to access those services. The issue again is scale. We actually know what ends homelessness. We know what to do. We don't have enough of any of it. We don't have enough interim solutions. 
We have about 1,000 shelter beds in Alameda County and 2,300 people unsheltered on any given night. So th there's no way. So we could build a lot of shelters and make sure everyone could go indoors, or we have to look at ways to make uh, camping outside more functional without making it okay for society to abdicate its responsibilities to house people. And that, I think that is the key, that is, that is the line we have to figure out how to walk together because we do not want to make it okay that because you have a disability in America and you're poor, then you end up being an outdoor camper. We have it's just wrong. A question back here, and then Leslie, I think I saw your hand go up next. So, hi, my name is Lisa, and I live or I work in um, the in, what we would consider the corridor to coming into Jack London Square. We're down in the area of Fourth, between Castro and Brush. Okay, we have the worst situation going on between Castro and Brush underneath the freeway. Okay, and. All the things that you guys have set up there is all legitimate and great, and I think there's a lot of people with mental health issues that do need somebody to walk them through the system because the system is extremely complicated because bureaucracy is extremely complicated. But there is also a fraction of homeless people that just want to be on the street, they want to be thieves, they want to break in, they want to steal from the, the neighbors, they don't care about keeping a clean site, they don't care about the garbage that they put. They don't care. Oh, excuse me, just a moment. Let her speak, please. Just a moment. I'm witnessing it every single day, okay? I come to my work. I work really hard. I have a computer. It was in my car. I literally parked in my driveway of my office, and within five minutes of going inside and coming out, my car had been broken into. I went over to the homeless encampment. I said, look, I don't care who has my computer. If you give me my computer back, I understand you guys have needs and you need money. I'm willing to give you $500 to give my computer back. The girl who was over in the homeless encampment that was very nice, she said, I will help you to get your computer back, but please don't give us $500 because they will spend it on drugs. We'd rather have you take us to Costco and buy socks and buy toothbrush and, and hygiene products because if you just give us cash, we will spend it. So A, I never got my computer back and they never came back for the $500 that I was willing to pay to get my computer back. It's these kind of things. I've had $30,000 worth of copper stolen out of our business because they come over our fence, whether we have razor wire or not. I see this every single day when I come in to work. And so, so my frustration is I've been on the phone with Keith Carson every single week reporting what is going on down here with the garbage and everything else. And we see prostitution, we see drug dealing, we find hyperdenic nurdles. There's gonna be a question. But I want everyone to understand, there's a huge problem going on down here. And I keep calling the city to try to get the city to help. And Keith Carson had made a great recommendation a year ago that we could use some of the free space out at the base to make it so that they have a place to go, put their tents, have waste management, have containers there for them for the garbage, have porta potties for a place for them to use the bathroom instead of defecating on our property and then covering it up with socks or whatever else they have to cover it up with. So I understand it's a problem and I'd like to see these people find houses, but I also would like to see the drugs, the prostitution and the breaking in and stealing things also be done, and I don't know what we can do. And Keith Carson says it's not an easy solution and it would take two or three years before they could even get approval to open up the base to have homeless. So that's where our frustration is as a business and as people living in the community. Um, I, I'd like to comment on that uh, a lot. <laughs> um, <clears throat> in the best way I possibly can. Um, First off, uh, I'm really familiar with uh, Brush Camp. I know a lot of the uh, uh, residents there. Um, you know, to try to put a personal angle on it, uh, the other day I went by, I saw a friend of mine, and he was a wreck. His father had just died in Kentucky, and he couldn't go back there because he couldn't afford to and also because he had a warrant there. Um, do not assume, and, and it is a big assumption 
I've heard it from not just you, but from a lot of people, that the crime that happens in and around the homeless camps is coming from the people who live in the homeless camps. Um, yes, there is a tremendous amount of substance abuse in the camps. Um, that is not a, 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 a moral deficiency. Um, it's a coping mechanism. Um, for a lot of people, the reasons they are on the streets are because they started that coping mechanism before they even ha were homeless. Um, and it's, it, it becomes even more necessary when they get on the streets. Uh, in my experience, again, the crimes that happen around our camps are actually usually from people outside of the neighborhoods. They come into the neighborhoods to do that because they know that we're an easy scapegoat. Um, me personally, I have a perfectly clean record and I've never defecated on your lawn. Um, it is fundamentally important to understand that people living on the streets are not there because they're, because they're wrong or because they're evil. And believe me when I tell you, nobody wants to be out there. Nobody wants the garbage. Some people snap. They just can't handle their own shit anymore. And so they, their, their stuff rolls out into the streets. I, I know someone, I know two people in the camp you're talking about. They're, they're, their spots are horrible. They've got broken bike parts all over the place, broken TVs all over the place. But at the same time, that area isn't really a popular pedestrian area. It wasn't before they started camping there. Um, and one of those guys is freaking amazing. He really is. He'll, he'll go the extra mile for everybody in any camp. Once you meet him, he'll be like, I got what you need. Two days later, it's in your hand. Um, in, near my camp, um, theft is a huge problem. Uh, there's a, a lot of parking going from where we are up to Jack London Square. Um, currently, the solution or one of the, the things that has been proposed as a solution is telling people don't leave stuff in your car. Um, and it sounds horribly like blaming the victim. And in a sense, it is. Um, but every time it happens, we're woken up at night and it is not us. It is not us, it's never been us. There is nobody in our camp who does that. And I'm not saying there's not in any camp, because there are. But believe me, they usually hop on a bike, ride to another area like ours, and do it so that they can get away easily. Um, and I hope everybody will excuse my language, you don't shit where you eat. It's that simple. Um, so and I'm very sorry, I totally understand the loss of, of personal items, you know, um, and a laptop is a huge one. It has all of your personal identity, all of that stuff on it. Um, if I see it, I'll get it for you. <laughs> um, and, and also, I think one of the, one of the important things uh, to, to remember in, in your frustration is that the person that you spoke to did tell you, we don't want your money. We're just going to spend it on dope. You know, if you want to take us to Costco. Right, and, but it's also in conflict with something else you said, which is that there are people out there who just want to be there. Um, I, I don't know anybody who um, would, I don't know anybody who would turn down a pair of socks. I do know people who would steal her laptop, absolutely. Uh, I do, there's a certain freedom that comes with it. However, there's, there's also um, a certain social, uh, aspect that comes with it, where you're kind of tired of people being peeing on you, you know, like socially peeing on you, looking down upon you. You know, it took me uh, two hours just to try to get clean enough to come here to present myself because I was embarrassed by the way I look. Um, and for some people, they go the opposite end. They're like, if I'm going to be treated this way, I'm going to act this way. Um, it's an unfortunate truth of the situation. And as I was telling someone before this, you know, the sanctioned encampments are going to be tremendous. They really are. There's going to be a lot of people who, who buy into it. Unfortunately, I don't even think it's going to be the majority of people. I think it's going to be a minority of people who buy into it. And it's not because they don't want housing. It's not because they don't want to be treated like a human. It's because they don't trust the system. Uh, there's a lot of monitoring that goes involved. And with uh, these mental health issues and, and substance abuse problems, there's a lot of paranoia that comes in. 
I think really the answer to your question is, is, is more complicated than, yeah, they want to be camping. I think they want, they want a certain life and they don't know how to get it. And camping provides some of those things, but it, everybody I know, I, I was really, really surprised just the other day when I was talking to someone about this and it was someone who I was like you, he just wants to stay on the street, you know? And he was like, man, if I could get a job and a place, I would be there. Um, people will surprise you. They really will. I just... Yeah. Could, could I just add really quickly, I, I, I just, I, I want to echo what Andy said and, I, and the, the idea that people are choosing to be homeless. As with any policy issue or, or, or social issue, I like to ask, compared to what? All right, so like when we, when we talk about providing housing, I, again, I can speak from the perspective of San Francisco and I know that conditions are not much better in Oakland, unfortunately. Um, oftentimes what we have to offer folks are two things. A single room without, with shared bathroom facilities. Oftentimes, I hate to say it, there's bed bug problems. Mm. It, they may be in neighborhoods that are uh, experiencing drug infestations or drug problems. Uh, I can't say that I would leap at the opportunity to live in that housing opportunity, in, in that place, right? So for a lot of individuals, particularly those who are struggling with their own sobriety and trying to stay clean and sober, uh, it's very difficult for them to accept the only thing that we have to offer in terms of, of getting them off the street. Mm -hmm. And I think that speaks to what we need to do more of as a, as a society is increase uh, our portfolio and increase access to exits. Um, in terms of shelter, for example, even if we did have shelter beds available, oftentimes it's sitting upright in a chair all night. Uh, I've spoken to many individuals on the street who, who prefer to camp out simply because they can lie down on their back, something that we take for granted when we go to bed at night, right? And um, so again, I, the idea of choosing to be homeless to me comes back to compared to what? If we were offering people uh, four bedroom vistas in the Oakland Hills, I guarantee you nobody would choose to be homeless. Um, so I'd like to speak to the question about the city and the port land or the old army base land. Um, the old army base right now is an active construction site. Um, it has been for the last two, two and a half years. Um, you may have heard about Prologis and CCIG. Um, I'm sure most of you heard about the coal and, and that whole battle. Um, and so the entire Oakland side of the Army base is now under um, development for warehouses, which will be a source of future jobs. And so there really isn't a place, a safe place, where we could uh, even have a sanctioned encampment. Uh, if you ever get a chance to drive out there and you really see what I'm talking about. Uh, and so we did look at that. The, the council member has been looking at a number of different options. Um, we are really lucky to have a group called the West Oakland Biz Alert who has been really kind of struggling with this concept for a very long time. And they came to our office and said, you know what, forget NIMBY. We would like to have a place in our backyard where we want to have a sanctioned encampment. We've even picked out a place where we'd like for you to go and explore and put this sanctioned encampment because we understand we're compassionate, but we also know that where it's located right now is not safe, nor is it sanitary, and there are health and safety concerns as we talk about the county being involved. Um, I'd like to uh, echo both of uh, the, the young men up here in saying that I think the encampments get a bad rap because people choose to do things around them because it's easy to point the fingers towards them. We hear that a lot about illegal dumping. Um, I've heard about folks coming to dump off furniture and just sometimes they mean well. They do. Oh, they might need a chair. I'm not using this anymore. Let me dump this right here. Um, them dumping food and different items without checking with the folks. You see there's different cultures, different um, genders and so forth. And so one encampment that is predominantly African-American male, somebody dropped off a big old pile of tofu, which <laughs> ended up going bad. Um, so I, I think that if we look at the larger picture, and you said it earlier when you first started talking, you said there are, there's a lot of mental illness 
And if we look at some of the behaviors and we see hoarding, and the hoarding just happens to be outside and it spills into the street, how do we address the fact that this particular individual obviously has a mental illness? They're, they're not trying to, to be disrespectful or disruptful, um, but you see the manifestation of their illness in a very public way. It's also um, a form of, of making money for them as well. Right, and so, and, and, and if, in, in, like you said in your camp, if instead of me going and breaking windows, um, I'm choosing to sell these items mm -hmm. or what I scavenge so that I can sell something, because mm -hmm. we strongly believe in our office in what's called the dignity of work. Everybody wants to feel like they're contributing. We went out last Saturday to the 35th and Peralta site and talked to some of the residents there. And the gentleman there said something really profound was, we just want to feel like we're a part of something. Give us some bags, give us a broom, we'll clean up. We want to be a part of this community too. As you're saying, people not looking down on them. So it's about being able to partner with our unhoused residents, find out what their needs are, and then be able to try to figure out these places where they could go. Now, one of the challenges has been, Biz Alert was one of the few places that came up and said, we think we have a place for you to go. But outside of Biz Alert, we haven't heard from any other group where they would be willing to have a sanctioned encampment. We've established, we've, we've looked at about 30 different places that are empty lots and so forth, private and public. We've had conversations with Caltrans because a lot of folks say, well, why can't you put them underneath the underpasses, right? Caltran has a state rule since Loma Prieta that they do not allow any human habitations underneath a freeway overpass anywhere under the state. We're not the only city. I think five other cities have asked them to do the same thing, and it's been an unequivocal no every single time. So we're, we're looking at some other spaces, trying to be as creative as possible, and being very open to community to come up and help us with some, but also asking community to be kind of flexible. We know that this is something affecting all of us, so we need the entire community to say, this is what we'll take. To your point, it's time, it, it has a time limit on it. We're not trying to set it up forever, and we're not trying to establish uh, this sentiment in the city, like it's okay if you just have it there. This is not the end all, it's just interim until we can get to a better place where we can get to that housing for all, and 2020 is not that far away. No. Um. <laughs> Yeah, um, so just to jump in with another question, um, and this is sort of twofold, but uh, one thing that I know, Sam, I, I'm here from the Coalition on Homelessness, um, one of the things that we've been struggling with in San Francisco is like terrible criminalization, right? That police are focusing a lot of energy on citing people for things that like I can do in my house perfectly legally, but you can't do on the street uh, legally, and so, um, this year we had been pushing for a homeless bill of rights that would make it illegal to give homeless people tickets or criminalize homeless people for things um, specifically as opposed to uh, thing, you know, something that I could do as a housed person. Um, and something that we saw when we went to Sacramento was that the mass mobilization to oppose the homeless bill of rights was coming from business improvement districts across the state, um, like this one. And um, so I'm, we're also part of a coalition, a statewide coalition, and part of the platform of that coalition is to challenge the authority of business improvement districts as um, undemocratic structures that oftentimes leave out the voices of homeless people as well as uh, anybody who doesn't own property um, in, in neighborhoods. So I'm curious, uh, how, how do we move forward and, uh, and address this without criminalization? And is there a way that business improvement districts could even be a part of that, um, given their advocacy around uh, striking down any kind of limits to policing? Well, I guess as a city representative, I'll speak to the criminalization piece of it. Um, our police force, believe it or not, the, the, these are really um, human folks, and they don't want to be in the position of having to criminalize uh, our unhoused residents. They do it reluctantly. Um, they'd rather Operation Dignity go out first. And they've really, they've also been at the table with us as we've talked about those long-term strategies. And their position is before they move an encampment, because we've gotten to that, that break-even point where you're moving it is not 
changing anything is before we move them, they want to have some place for them to go. Mm -hmm. um, and so at least on the city of Oakland side, and I, we have the council member here, if I'm, if I'm misspeaking, is that it's not about criminalization. They know that blocking the sidewalk is misdemeanor. You know, what's the point of giving a ticket to somebody who's already down and out? You're just adding insult to injury. Um, and so it's not about, you know, criminal. There, there may have been a point in time before that where there was a lot of movement. I think we've hit a, a, a portion now where we're just, at least in our district, not trying to move so much as to find this other interim solution because we know that just clearing an encampment is not solving anything. Yeah, I, I, go ahead. Um, I, I think that... Um, you know, some of the some of the obvious things you're talking about uh, public urination um, anybody on the street who has a, a romantic partner it can be incredibly difficult to find a private place to spend private time with each other um, it, it, it can be yeah frustrating that yeah even when the police don't harass us for these things and I will say it, it's gone down from from the uh, last time I was homeless to this time, it, it's it's significantly diminished. Uh, it seemed before like every week I was hearing about somebody getting cited, even even like taken in for a 24 because they were they were drunk and publicly urinated behind their own tent. You know, uh, and and uh, I don't know if people are aware of this, but that's actually something that can put you on the sex offenders list um, if somebody wants to be especially cruel. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, no, um, and even though the police have started limiting their, their stuff with that, um, and I'm glad they have, uh, it's, there's still a matter of, of your own privacy, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, dehumanizing to have to do that. Um, there's also, um, as far as the businesses, I live in a unique camp where we are not directly near any commercial businesses, we are near... Um, a place that's uh, kind of a combination charity business and we get a tremendous we d we found out recently that um, all of th that a lot of the police action that comes to our camp uh, as well as uh, Caltrans is directly because of them which I find horribly ironic since every single one of their residents is technically homeless um, they just happen to have showers and bathrooms and are fed there uh, I wanted to comment real quickly because shelters have come up quite a bit and I don't know if people are aware that in Oakland we, we have like a tremendous uh, uh, shelter, within Oakland itself, a uh, tremendous shortage of beds. Yeah. Um, we open up emergency beds during um, bad weather seasons. Uh, those go really quick. Uh, in fact, for someone like me who is not a vet, uh, is under the age of 50 and is male, my only real option within Oakland is City Team Charities, um, which costs $5 per night. Um, if you don't have an income, $5 is harder to get than you think. Uh, and um, yeah, and uh, parasites and that kind of thing are, are a really horrible problem. I was at a group home in the in-betweens of being really homeless. Uh, and yeah, it, it, it it's insane, you know, like, it, you, I went from a situation where I was at least private in a tent, you know, I had my own space and everything. I had no parasites whatsoever. I, I, I tried to stay as clean as possible, keep my area as clean as possible, into an area where I was living in a room with four other men in bunk beds with bed bugs and the management refused to acknowledge that the bed bugs were even there. Um, so I chose to come back and be homeless, you know, like it, 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 I went from a situation that was bad, obviously, and people telling me this will be better and it was worse. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to throw that out there. I was told that's why I'm here. <laughs> I, 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 I really appreciate your per personal narrative and, and want to offer some uh, data in support of that because data is one of the things yeah. everyone home does. Um, I, it is true that there are, are a lot of um, things that compromise uh, the quality of life in a community, not just for people in encampments, but for the community that surrounds it, and criminal activity. But as often as not, and in some cases more often, that activity is not done by homeless people. 
It's often done by people in the encampments who are exploiting that environment for criminal activity or sort of exploiting the fact that people associate dumping with homeless people, panhandling with homeless people, drug use with homeless people. And so I think San Francisco did a study five or 10 years ago of uh, aggressive panhandlers and less than half of them were actually homeless. A number of them had a place to live and that is often an activity that is cited in association with homelessness. I, I just returned from uh, a meeting in DC of communities like ours across the country about what's going on with encampments. And a colleague of mine from the city of Houston said when they did their homeless count and they were going through encampments at 11 o'clock at night, the population was huge. When they came back at four in the morning, it was a third of the size. And a lot of the drug use and drug sales and assaults that were occurring were not from homeless people, they were to homeless people. And so I, I think we have a challenge in trying to navigate this so that we don't criminalize activities that are required to survive, like going to the bathroom or eating or sleeping, but that we also recognize that when we create these outdoor spaces and we, and uh, or look the other way, we leave the folks that have to sleep in them vulnerable to the activities of criminals. And, and so there does need to be some kind of law enforcement uh, connected to this, but we need to do it in a humane way. And sadly, we most often have done it by criminalizing homeless people instead of criminalizing criminals that are in Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh, sure. Um, so, JLIT has actually done, and, and not to blow smoke, but JLIT has actually done a, a really good job of actually pulling in businesses um, a, a, about this conversation. Um, I've been blown away by how positive all of the businesses participating in the com uh, conversation have been. I haven't heard one single business owner uh, try to push us out of Jack London even, you know, which is surprising. Um, there are some, you know, th and there's always going to be questions of liability um, and that kind of thing. Uh, everybody wants to cover their own ass. But there have been things brought up of what can we do about food distribution. There's restaurants that want to help us that can't. Um, Ike's uh, Sandwiches um, has a tremendously cool uh, way of handling it. They're, they're not supposed to give out food that has, you know, hasn't been picked up or is a mistake or whatever, but they have a lot of it after every single shift. Mm -hmm. So rather than just throw it away, they can't directly hand it to us. They'll come out and they'll set it next to us and we can go through it. Um, it's little simple solutions like that. What I think that a business improvement district can do if they do it right, like JLID has, um, they'll ask us to come and talk about what we need and what we'd like and let the, the businesses kind of ponder on that and find solutions. They have a lot more influence than we do. Uh, and when those businesses are run by compassionate people, uh, I think solutions can happen. Does that answer the question at all? Or? Unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> um, my, like, my organization, we, do, we have a lot of public meetings like, in, in encampments. And, yeah. um, so I've been talking to people a lot about their experiences with ambassadors. And I also like, went to JLIT's meetings for a few months yeah. um, and have talked to people in, in their homeless area about their experience with ambassadors. Yep. And so I'm hearing what you're saying. I'm glad that, that JLIT feels like uh, it's trying to work with y'all. But I'm still, I guess, still feel really critical of what they're doing. I, I just do want too. Go Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, politically, historically, I mean, I, I have some fairly radical politics. And, and uh, like I told Savlan the first time I went in there, I was like, it feels really weird coming into the, into the enemy's den, you know? Um, but I don't know. They, they currently, in, in what we have, they do have the power, you know? I would love to see a homeless bill of rights. I would love to see... Um, uh, 
organizations uh, created from inside out that could um, be more vocal and have more influence on what it is we need and how we feel we can get out of this, that kind of thing. So, I, I don't want to um, condone any injustices that have been committed by property owners here and there, and I'm sure there have been some. Um, at the same time, I, I can't imagine that every business is flush with cash. And I think uh, oftentimes businesses operate razor-thin profit margins. Hang on, hang on one sec. Operate razor-thin profit margins. And so anything that is perceived to be detrimental to the operation of their day-to-day -day business, I think is something that they, as, as people who are trying to contribute to their own economy, are justified in taking action on. Unfortunately, I, again, I like to challenge you to think compared to what? Unfortunately, people call the police because they have, other, they have no other option on whom to call. And so one thing, Elaine mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, coordinated entry. Uh, not only does coordinated entry allow us to be more creative and more um, systematic in the way that we approach actually housing, but I think it also opens new doors to being creative about how we include other non-traditional homeless, not, you know, non-traditional providers in the community or people who are not providers such as the police to be involved and be constructive. So for example, the city of Las Vegas has a very robust coordinated entry program. They have a very robust data system uh, that allows uh, police officers, for example, to log on to the data system. They do not see any identifying information, so none of that is compromised. What they do see is, has this person, be asset, has this person been assessed, and is there a bed at a shelter or at housing available for them? So rather than having no other options except to choose whether or not to enforce a sit-lie law, for example, they now have another tool in their arsenal as a police force to direct people into a, a, a positive uh, direction. And so I think as we work as, as counties to implement coordinated, coordinated entry, which is a mandate from the federal government, we have the opportunity as well to work with business improvement districts and the police forces to, uh, to include them as well about how do we move people in the right direction rather than criminalizing for lack of other options. Can we, um, sorry, move on to another question. Um, one of the things that I want to, a couple of things that I want to say, um, I'm typically not somebody who likes to raise sort of bigger picture issues. I'm a very sort of nuts and bolts, what can we do down here kind of person. But I do want to say, we have heard repeatedly tonight that this is a community, this specific neighborhood, this specific community is replete with businesses and property owners who are here to try to help and improve things. And I would like, I can't speak for other communities, I can speak for this one. I want you to hear that loud and clear, okay? That, that has been said repeatedly tonight. In an effort to look at, um, some of the problems with housing, I'm concerned about the MTC and ABAG merger, and um, because you are here from Alameda County, I, one of the things that we continue to hear, you said in Berkeley there's problems with housing, how do we make sure that we are encouraging the building and construction of housing of all income levels from zero all the way up to market rate so that we're making sure sure that there's enough supply and that we are addressing the fact that, you know what, Lafayette's got to do its fair share, Orinda's got to do its fair share, Concord, Walnut Creek, Pleasanton, everybody has to do more building. And if MTC railroads ABAG, we, what we have in ABAG continues to become weaker and weaker and we end up with less housing for people. And the final thing that I want to say, and I don't know the solution to that, but I'd love to hear your comments. The final thing that I want to say is somebody who has worked hard to employ my neighbors. I have 70 employees working for me right now, almost all of them from within blocks of where we were um, located. If we don't work hard to find employment solutions, there is no such thing as affordable housing. You cannot, you cannot afford housing if you don't have a means of income. So I don't want us to be focused on housing to the exclusion of thinking about how are we gonna have opportunities for people to pay for the housing that may be available to them. So I'll respond, I'll spend more time on your first question, but wanna say that I wholeheartedly agree that people need incomes. 
but I will also say that there are uh, the majority of homeless adults are uh, living with long-term disabilities, and that doesn't mean that they can't be employed, but it may mean that that they might not end up employed at a market wage. I, I think uh, um, the National uh, Low-Income Housing Network has estimated that uh, you need to work 200 hours at minimum wage in the Bay Area to afford a two-bedroom apartment, so that's not even possible. There aren't that many hours in a week. Um, so it is income and affordability. So I was suggesting full spectrum, not just yeah. market Yeah, okay. exactly. And then on, on the housing, so I do want to say Everyone Home is a, is a nonprofit that provides technical assistance and leadership to city governments and other nonprofits. So because I don't work for Alameda County, what I want to say is the most immediate thing you can do is vote for the housing bond in November on the ballot. And then while we're doing the campaign and after the campaign, because there'll be a citizen's advisory council, is make sure that money gets spent building units to house the lowest income folks. So the Board of Supervisors made a commitment that at least 20% of the $585 million that bond is, at least 20% of it will go for units at people at 20% of AMI or below. So it was the 20 for 20 campaign. The pressures to spend that money on people at 50% of area median and workforce housing and things that are also needed in our community and make affordable housing more easy to run and less of a razor thin margin, the pressures to go in that direction will be intense. So if you care about more housing available for homeless people, you guys have to be our, help us be the public watchdog on how those bond monies get spent. So that is both big picture, but relatively immediate because I think Hillary Clinton just said yesterday, it's 100 days till the election. So it's at least within 100 days. That is a decision we can make as a county that has the opportunity to begin tipping the scales in a better direction. Um, and I do, I do think, it, I think it goes back to citizen accountability on uh, the, the broader level. The, the 20 for 20 campaign, we went to Oakland City Council with the 20 for 20 campaign on its uh, bond, uh, its infrastructure bond. Uh, the city of Fremont is looking at a measure. The city of Fremont has passed an inclusionary zoning that's more aggressive than the city of Oakland's. So again, I think it is really citizen organizing to keep saying this issue matters and it needs to translate. So we'll, we'll vote for housing money, we'll vote for housing measures, but we need to make sure those housing measures actually benefit poor people. I want I wanted to comment on the, the idea of employment. First off, employment is not, uh, like both of you actually kind of said, uh, employment actually isn't going to solve the homeless problem. It, it's barely going to make a dent in it. But I also think um, it's really important because I know that there's a lot of uh, job creators in the room. Um, you guys aren't employed. You, you know, it's important to go, to keep an open mind that maybe the people on the street aren't cut out to be employees, but they might just have something that would make them job creators. Um, I think we have a tendency to want to get people jobs rather than uh, help them contribute to um, that kind of thing, to businesses. Entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurial, uh, artisans, uh, that kind of thing. There's a whole field of, of solutions there that kind of go outside of, of this talk here. Um, but it's just something I wanted to put out there uh, and hopefully seed some stuff. Who's, who's calling yes. on people? Question <laughs> over here. Yeah, oh, here you go. got the microphone. He's, you've got the talking <laughs> stick. Yeah. I know that. Um, I think that's really, really important in this issue and this questions of encampments and sanctioned encampments, because that's really what we're talking about. Sure. Local solutions to homelessness. There, there's no local solution to homelessness. It has to be 
federal. It has to be on a larger level. There has to be a commitment to building housing on a, on a federal level. And as long it, and we're doing the best we can on the county level and the city level, but it's not going to work unless the federal stuff snaps in. Yeah. I That's why we're talking about sanctioned encampments. And a lot of people are very, a lot of homeless people, a lot of formerly homeless people, a lot of advocates are very concerned about the idea of sanctioned encampments because you, you have a high probability of a situation that sanctioned encampments are set up to fail for the, some of the reasons that An Andy talked about. That they'll exclude people, only certain people will be able to handle the, the weirdness of it. It won't be supported and completely funded. And with sanctioned encampments, you have unsanctioned encampments, which means further reasons to criminalize the unsanctioned people. So I have a, my, my question is, what are the elements, briefly, some of the positive elements of how does sanctioned encampments work while unsanctioned encampments also work? What are some of those elements? I mean, I think, I think you're right. Both both models do work. Um, there's, a, there's a kind of a NIMBY problem with sanctioned encampments that you touched on. Um, but I don't think anybody would be upset if a KOA opened up in their backyard. And I mean, we talked about this. It's, it's, it's kind of the same model. What are, what are some of the positives of, of both? Uh, um, I think that if, if both are allowed to exist, you'll have a lot It'll, it'll be a snowball effect so long as the, the sanctioned encampments are given support from the, from the non-homeless community, from businesses, from uh, our local politics. Uh, and it will influence other camps. I know that for me, the reason that I'm in the camp I am in is because it's very publicly visible. It's safer that way. Um, it's also more profitable that way. We get a lot of donations just because people know we're there. Um, and I know that when I talk to other people in uh, other camps, that when I tell them that, they're like, you know, that's, that's right. They're always wanting to come in. We only have limited space, you know, and we try to keep a fairly clean camp. So, um, you know, the regulation that we do is from, from inside. Uh, I, th I think we're also talking that with sanctioned encampment, most of the regulation is still going to come from, from inside the camps. Um, uh, I, I, kind of losing the plot here. I'll pass it on. <laughs> so, so what uh, we're in discussion about is two different models. When I say sanctioned and unsanctioned, unsanctioned is happening and it's going to happen anyway. That's what we currently have, our unsanctioned campgrounds. We have unsanctioned communities and families of folks who have gathered together, as you mentioned. Um, the sanctioned in campground is basically finding a spot that the city or, will, or the county can say, this is where we will allow you to, not just allow, but you will be able to have your campground here, we'll bring services, we'll be able to provide sanitation and so forth at this place, we'll know where you are, we'll have staff specifically for you at this particular location. The other model that we also are looking at right now because, as I mentioned earlier, finding that space to do a sanctioned encampment has been challenging, is uh, uh, shelter in place. Meaning wherever that particular campground is, to again bring the sanitation, bring the services there, and for a time period say, okay, this campground will be here for X amount of time. We wanna work with everybody who's here and then after a particular amount of time, we're gonna to have to move or clear this particular space. It won't be allowed to continue here. Um, and I, I, I'm seeing some, some head shaking. That's working in partnership, but the whole purpose of that is that you would have intense services provided to the folks there. As you were talking about having first right for housing, first right for uh, any type of services, those people in that particular campground would have everything specifically for them. Uh, so those are the two models that we're looking at right now, which there's, there's pros and cons to both of them, but as we're talking about a meantime or right now we have to deal with the situation as it stands, those are what we're looking at doing and again, welcome any feedback, ideas, thoughts, that you may have about whether or not those will work. We're still in the developmental phase right now. Um, and so looking for input from community 
on what they think will work and where it will work to do that. Where does um, I can give out my number and you can call me, you can email me, contact, yeah, contact the office. Uh, we can set up face-to-face -face meetings. We've done that with several community members who have gone out uh, to different areas. We've gone out to the campgrounds themselves, um, talked to folks on Wood Street, talked to folks on 35th, talked to folks on Northgate. It's all over the district and we will talk to our residents wherever they are. I have the next question. And I know there's a lot of questions, so I'll get right to it. Uh, thank you for the thank you to the panel and to everyone here that clearly cares about this issue a lot to take this time. Um, I'm hoping naively to leave here tonight with a sense that Oakland has a plan. Um, I'm hearing a lot about the problem and the frustration and and the and the hope that we can honor this human right. Um, but if Oakland was pressed to have a solution, um, I'll go. I'll be so bold as to say a one month solution a one year, and a five year. What is the plan um, to take care of our homeless population, to house them um, in a situation that doesn't have bed bugs and, and that we're giving them the, the dignity of, of housing? What is the plan? Everybody looks at me. <laughs> oh, I, I, I'm not the council member. Oh, good night. Um, <laughs> so to your point, I don't think there is a plan. To, to move it. I think there um, is a start of here's what we'd like to be able to do and there are different parts that are being put into place to make that happen but if you say what is the layout for ending homelessness I've never seen that and again I'm not the council member she may have information that I don't know that's that's out there but from what we know that there is not this overall plan yet but I, I believe now there's a coming together between the city and the county leaderships, particularly for District 3, I can't speak for the other areas, um, to try to create something along those lines. And so that's where we are right now. That's why I was talking about the input, because we're trying to get there. So uh, what, what I will say is there actually was approved by all of the cities in Alameda County and the county its government itself in 2007, a plan to end homelessness by 2020. And it had five major strategies, prevent homelessness, expand housing opportunities, wrap people with services that they wanted and needed to improve the quality of their lives and stay housed, uh, measure our results and hold ourselves accountable and build political will. So we're about halfway through the time period for implementing the plan to end homelessness and we are revising and refining it. So uh, uh, we are making adjustments based on some of the developments. Uh, our overall homeless population, for example, in Alameda County is relatively flat, but we have seen spikes in unsheltered populations in Oakland and Berkeley. Uh, and so we're taking a look at that. So what I will um, say from everyone home's perspective the, the one month plan is conversations like this one to look at what the very pressing and immediate thing is, but there is definitely very clearly one year plans. So one of them is that the coordinated entry will be operational countywide within a year, and that will include both strategies to, to help people solve their housing problem before needing shelter or needing to be outside. So maybe resolve some of the dynamics where they're staying at the time or ad address an unpaid utility bill or um, uh, uh, solve some conflicts so that they can stay housed. Uh, the other is to expand street outreach uh, so that we can find folks who have, been, uh, have had the worst experience with the system and are the most challenged to navigate its hoops. We have actually this month, on the 18th of July, reopened what we call the home stretch registry. So when you come across people who have been homeless and for a long time and are managing a living with a disability, you can go on the Everyone Home website and refer them into the home stretch registry. So that actually maybe is the one month, uh, just to, to cover your bases. But we, have ex we are now trying to have a singular registry for those folks and 
uh, streamline their access to permanent housing. But that will be at scale across the entire county within a year, we anticipate. Uh, so coordinated entry that includes street outreach. The other thing that we've done is we've applied to the state of California to use Medicaid dollars, and David may want to speak more to this, but to use Medicaid dollars to expand outreach by dozens and dozens of street outreach workers and get to a 24-7 street outreach capacity and to have what we call housing navigators to help people get their documents ready and to search for housing and, and move into housing and for uh, people we're calling housing locators to recruit landlords to participate and to create a bank of landlords that willing to rent to folks who have had a, a history of housing loss. So those things are all in the works for a year from now. And they are really solution to, towards ending people's homelessness. But even so, they will take a while to get to scale. And we want to pass that housing bond. That's part of the plan. And so in five years, we'll have more housing to give people. But what we've seen in communities across the country that have had coordinated entry, they have seen drops in their homeless populations of 20, 25 percent because they're using resources more effectively and they're streamlining people off the street and they're keeping people from ending up on the street. So we intend to do those things so that homelessness in five years is rare and brief, 30 to 90 days at the most, not years and years like it is now, rare, brief, and non-reoccurring. So you end up in a place that's tolerable to live, not the place that you described. And that is where we are trying to get. But one of the key strategies was political will. So public conversations like this are critical and public organizing and work and holding folks accountable to translate those dollars where they need to be and, and holding us with the vision accountable that the vision translates. So I would say there is a plan and there are some challenging elements of the plan. And the question of encampments is one of the most challenging ones. And we're clearly not solving homelessness fast enough that we don't need to be responsive to the fact that there are people living outdoors right now. Yeah, I, everyone. It's hard for me to stand up, so home. you know I won't subject you to that. I've been going to lots of council meetings about housing, right? Yes, and you know they went on for they went on for months, and the behind the scenes went on for years, and finally they came up with a plan and they came up with alternatives, and then the um, the compromise when it came to how much money developers would have to give for benefits like affordable housing was, was Lynette McElhaney, Gibson's, Gibson McElhaney, I'm sorry, her, her compromise put it about as far out as it could go. In other words, it was the most conservative, the most conservative uh, outline of how much and when we would, we would uh, get money from developers. Meanwhile, the developers are coming in and they're building like mad and they want to be here, but we can't get past the fact that we think we have to give developers something to live in Oakland. And having said that, there are housing, uh, there's a Renter Protection Act on the ballot. We've got 100 days until election day. If your organization, or you're not part of an organization that's working on that, I suggest you, you line up with one like OCO or ACE or uh, Block by Block Organizing Network or, or any of many, many others and work on that campaign and see that those, that those protections get passed. Thank you. Okay. And, and I know there are many questions and I also want to get people um, we, we've said this would be over at seven, and our, our very generous panelists have been here. Ask, <laughs> maybe some of them are, are willing to stay a little bit afterwards and continue the conversations, but I'd like to sum it up with one last question, and only because it's now 7.30 and you've all been very generous with your time. Um, so,
one last question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I guess try to like sum all my thoughts up. Um, one thing that really stuck out is like the hundred thousand dollars that you got. Just seems like I'm sure it took a lot of effort, but it seems like a joke. And like getting a quarter of what you got, trying to apply that when I'm sure four hundred thousand dollars wasn't nearly enough, anyways, to begin with. So I kind of want to know like if. And this is, I mean, if we were living in a system where the people could use government to do what we need to do to solve this problem, which, you know, apparently we're not living in, what would we actually do? Like, what, how much money do you need to solve this problem? And I also want to ask, why can't you provide bathroom services and sanitary services without kicking people out of their homes at the end? Like, that's what they need. They don't need to be kicked out of their homes. That's the one thing that this gentleman said was the, like, one of the hardest things and you're unable to give that to them without tying, like without kicking them out of their homes at the end, out of these spaces. Okay. So the, the $190,000, uh, even the 400000 that was originally asked for, uh, understanding that, as you guys may well know, the city is under a, a tremendous crunch on a whole lot of different levels, was seed money to be able to go back to the county, to philanthropists, to show that the city had some skin in the game. I think a lot of times when the city asks for other agencies to do things, um, they believe that the city's not serious because they don't invest in it themselves. And so um, with Lynette having this original initial 190000 to be able to leverage that money, and she has been talking to foundations, she has been talking to other agencies to be able to get even more. The estimate that we got um, to be able to move, and, and please don't quote me if I don't have all of this correct, um, for to to take an encampment of I want to say 90 to full housing would be 1.2 million to be able to do that. This total budget of the city of Oakland, I think, is a little bit less than 900 and some odd million, and that's for everything. Um, and so that's why it's really critically important that we partner with the county and other uh, agencies that have deeper pockets than us to be able to solve that problem. Um, the question about the timeline of having an end date for a, a shelter in place or a camp in place, um, that was really in talking about compromising with the neighbors. The neighbors have said, we will, you know, go ahead and do this, but we want to have a certain timeline by which you'll be able to say this area is clear. Um, we know right now there are campgrounds that are on sidewalks that are obstructing. There's different things the lady in the back talked about happening. And so part of the problem and part of the reason why PD has not been saying you need to move is that we're not offering any place for them to go. It's just not fair. Move for what? Where do, where do you want me to go? There's no place to send them. But if we create places and say, we have some place we'd like for you to go, it's better than being in the street right here. Six months, we want to be able to get you to move, and we'll, we'll offer this to you. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not just saying after six months, you have to go. It's providing services while we intensely work to provide housing for those individuals at that site, and then afterwards, that site will no longer be a campground. And I think that speaks to the point about we're not trying mentally, we don't need to create a scenario where camping outside is okay. We, as a society, and I think she said it best, if we cr continue to allow the campgrounds to persist without putting all of our time and effort into trying to end homelessness, then we just create this ongoing scenario where it's okay for people to be homeless. It is very challenging to say, okay, we don't want that to be here anymore, but that just forces us. And that's you forcing the electeds, forcing philanthropies and other folks to say, take this seriously, put time, money, and energy into making sure that these folks don't have to be on the street. Because if we allow it, that means we accept it and we approve it. And I think we're saying that it's not approved that no one should be homeless and have to sleep underneath Caltrans. To that point, very briefly. 
Voice so, so we, ha we haven't gotten to that point yet. Again, this is an idea. And again, welcoming feedback if you have other ideas. And it may be at the six months where it's like, you know what? We didn't have a place to put them. We're going to have to rethink this. Come back to community and say, we know we told you guys six months, but here's the situation, guys. This is us working together in partnership to talk about what's the reality on the street. So I can't say what happens at six months because we, we haven't got to that point yet. The gentleman over here's question uh, earlier raised an, an essential issue. Homelessness is a problem of federal proportion. It is the result yes. of decades of disinvestment at the federal level in social welfare programs and in housing programs. Uh, and so it is a problem of national scope. It requires a solution of national scope. It is not the city of, Oakland problem, city of Oakland's problem alone, nor is it the city of, of San Francisco, for that matter's problem alone, to foot the amount of money necessary to fix the problem at scale. It's a federal problem. And we as a federal government for the past several decades have failed to address that. In the meantime, we cannot allow the perfect to be the enemy of the good. Yes. The perfect solution is spending all of the money necessary to house everyone. The good, in the meantime, is a $190,000 pilot program to at least reduce criminalization, improve public health outcomes, and hopefully improve services towards housing for folks on the street who currently have no other options. I just want to say, um, yeah, the $190,000, when I, when I heard that, I was kind of blown away. But then I thought, how much does a lot cost? How much do showers at that lot? We might be pushing the boundaries here because for a sanctioned encampment, it's, it's up to us to move in. We've already got all the other stuff we need, you know, and we're not even asking for the city to provide us with food or anything like that. Just a place to take a bath, you know, um, just a place to hang out where this is honest to God truth. Um, somebody driving down Webster decided to throw eggs at us randomly one day, uh, driving a, a, a gray suburban, you know, I mean, you can look at us as the dregs of humanity, but I've seen some of the worst come from how we're treated. Um, we just want to be treated well. And so the 190,000, you're talking to people who are used to getting 50 cents spare change to make their night better. Um, a sanctioned encampment sounds fucking great to me. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, I'd love to get into an apartment. I'd love to get into even a shared housing situation, which I'm looking at, you know, on my own. Um, I, you know, my personal life comes with a whole lot of other issues that make it difficult for me to maintain employment, so on and so forth. But if I'm in a place where uh, I'm not, I'm at less risk of um, people coming into the camp with criminal intent, uh, people from outside the camp uh, harming us, making fun of us, it, it may sound like a, a little thing, but it, for someone like me, it's actually kind of a pretty big thing. Um, uh, what I want to, and I want to kind of echo what you said about don't let perfect uh, eliminate the good, you know. Um, don't let the big picture eradicate the small one. Don't get so frustrated because it's a huge problem. It's a social problem. It's an economic problem. It's a health problem. Don't let the size of the problem stop stop from even just the smallest favor, you know? Um, each one of us have a capacity for compassion. I think the sanctioned encampments, I think the decriminalization of the camps that are currently there um, is the most compassionate thing we can do right now, regardless if it's $190,000 or someone saying, I've got this vacant lot, they can stay here. No. Five percent of people on the street are veterans. We can't do this alone. This is a national problem. And we have to elect people and we have to make our voices heard about this. We didn't go to fight. We sent other people and they come home and we leave them on the street. We have to wake up. Thank you. Thank you. So I, just, just to point a correction, it's not 75%. It's about 8% in Alameda County. And we've actually brought down the number of homeless veterans by over a third. And Obama announced at the Democratic 
convention that veterans homelessness is down by 50%, and that's because the federal government has invested in solving that problem, and communities have gotten on board, like Alameda County, and joined the campaign to end veterans homelessness. We know what to do if we generate the resources and the political will to get it done. And, and the political will comes from all of, all of you. And so I, for one, am really grateful to have had the opportunity to speak with you and support your, and hopefully to support your work and efforts here in this neighborhood in the future. I think we're going to, I think we got you, Miss, you, you had, okay. You. So that's part of the plan that we're looking at currently and looking to raise the money to do it. The, for 30, for, 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 so, so for a camp, for a camp of around 30, that 190 includes the porta potties, the case management, wraparound services, um, bringing in a uh, portable shower. Uh, on, a, on a regular basis. So we are looking at doing all of those things. I don't have the count. I, I wish Susan Shelton was here to talk about the number of encampments that are throughout District 3. Uh, just off the top of my head, the ones that I know of, I can probably call about 20, ranging in size. So to your point, yes, we, we definitely want to look at doing that as one of the options. The question is the scale, the prioritization, and the funding of, all, of doing all of those things. If there's, if any of the panelists have a final thought, I want to give you the time, but you've all been so, so generous with your time, and thank you so, so much. Thank you all for spending your Monday evening with us also. Um, are there any, can we just invite people to continue conversations and, uh, you know, the, we, we hope we facilitated a, a, a productive conversation on this, and it just needs to continue. We, uh, we will continue the conversation. So thank you so much for being here with us. <laughs> thank you.